We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Well, good morning. First of all, my sincere thanks and appreciation, Dr. Allen, for your gracious hospitality, you and your uh, student staff who uh, helped me get here from Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, I'm glad I brought my long coat because I didn't know you were going to have ice and snow. So, But uh, it's, it's wonderful to be with you and see you once again. We've, we go back a few years, as we mentioned last night. Um, I also want to just thank you uh, here in this student body, the faculty and staff, but also those of you who are students as you're on this journey towards uh, providing ministry in such a very uh, challenging day in which we live for such a time as this. So thank you for answering uh, the call uh, to the ministry. Dr. Allen, I did not mention to you, but when I did my doctorate, I actually footnoted you in your book, Discerning the Call, and about the importance uh, of maintaining your link to the local church uh, so that they can support you all your days uh, as you go out and do great things for the Lord. Regarding my biography, my wife would be amiss if I did not tell you. I've, I, we celebrated uh, 50 years of marriage last year. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She was 13 when I first met her. I was 16. I know it sounds terrible, but it's, that, it is what it is. And we've been on this journey together. I've, t- I've moved her 26 times around the world, uh, three or four continents. We have two adult daughters and five grandchildren, and um, I'm so grateful for my, for my family. Well, with the time that I have this morning, I'd like you to turn with me uh, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. I know that you had Dr. D.A. Carson here a week or a few weeks ago, and I read his book not too long ago on prayer. So some of the things I'm saying this morning uh, might reflect back on him, but I'm not preaching his message. But uh, he really opened my eyes to this passage beginning with verse 14 of chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory... He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with with all the fullness of God. I've got to read verse 20. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Father, I pray that you would take this simple servant, hide me behind the cross, O God. Speak through me in spite of me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This year, October the 18th, I will celebrate 43 years as an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was called to the ministry 60 years ago at a small church in North Georgia, and uh, not only called to the ministry as a pastor, but one of our deacons' sons came to visit the church and speak, and he was wearing a uniform of the United States Air Force. And at that age, 14 years old, I I believe that there's a great marriage between being a pastor of a church and then a pastor wearing the uniform of the armed services. And that's where God eventually led me. You know, you look back over a long life of ministry and you wonder, how did you survive it? 
that is a word that you can say about the ministry. It is a survival uh, mode, but it's also an overcoming mode. Amen? Uh, this, the reason that I'm still standing as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that uh, it's all by the grace of God. Uh, it's all because it's a team sport. My wife has walked with me in the journey and prayed me through it. I'm married to a Proverbs 31 woman. The church has supported me um, as a pastor, as a chaplain. And I've had a number of spiritual fathers and mothers. I would challenge you if you don't have someone, a spiritual father or mother. Paul says that we have not many of those people who mentor and speak into our lives. Uh, I'm, I've required a lot of work. I've, I've had three spiritual fathers in my life, all of them now with the Lord, and two precious spiritual mothers who have spoken life into me. But I want to confess this morning that over that 60-year period of time, I've actually thought about resigning from the ministry one particular time. They say a lot of preachers on Monday mornings to actually write their resignation letters. Um, I never did that, but one time I thought, I'm done with the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As far as pastoring, I was engaged in a situation with, a, with an individual uh, that had some deep and painful spiritual wounds. And we, I had a, had a team of chaplains who worked with me as we tried to minister to this particular individual. Um, but nothing worked as we prayed and encouraged and walked with this particular person. It, it almost became, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, a, a harassing ordeal uh, with this particular person. And... Uh, the individual uh, manifested a lot of kinds of things that I did not learn in seminary. Some would say it's in the area of spiritual warfare. Um, by the way, you will not learn everything there is to, to know about the ministry. Some of it's going to take some experience out there in the hard knocks. Amen. But one particular night I said, Lord, nothing's working. This person's not getting better. They're getting worse. And it's taking all of my time and all of my effort. So... Uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning in Schweinfurt, Germany, a very dark place, uh, full of uh, frustration, anxiety, some fear, I resigned. I said, Lord, I quit. I can't do this. I, I, I don't have the capacity of what it takes to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, walking and working under his power and authority. I, I feel so weak, frustrated, foolish. Uh, I'm not the man that you need. Lord, send me back to that little simple church in North Georgia where everybody loves one another. There's no ministry problems or conflicts and those kinds of things. And I still remember God through the Holy Spirit reminding me of a very powerful verse. It went something like this. Um, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness, because when you admit, when you realize that you are weak, I'm going to show you a strength and a power like you can imagine. You're the, you're the person that I need as you have humbled yourself to me in your weakness. I'm rehiring you. I can't tell you how that ministered to me and gave me a renewed confidence not in my power and strength, not in my ability to do great things for the Lord, not my education, but relying on the power of God to do what he would want me to do. You know, the scripture reminds us throughout. I could give you scriptures all morning. The book of Isaiah chapter 40, he gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases their strength that even young people, they may grow tired and weary, Young men and women may, may faint and fall, but they that hope in the Lord, they who look to the Lord for his strength, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not be faint. Jesus reminds us that without him, we can do nothing. Now, why in the world is Paul praying for the strength of the power of God, from the, according to his riches, why is he praying that God's strength comes through the power of the Holy Spirit and ministers to the inner being 
of the people of the church of Ephesus. The scripture says that they were losing heart. They were suffering. Looking at Paul and all the ordeal that he was going through as a prisoner of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a Roman prison, they they became fearful. They were being overwhelmed. They were worried. They were anxious, like, hey, maybe this is not for me. I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Last night, someone sent me a video, kind of the timing is perfect, uh, of Kara Lawson. I don't know if you know Kara Lawson. If you're Duke fans in here, you know, we are in the uh, March Madness. Uh, Kara Lawson is the women's coach for the Duke women's basketball team. In 2022, as they were kind of facing a fork in the road between success and failure, she gave them a pep talk that's worth you maybe looking at sometime. It's about two or three minutes long. Here's an excerpt. You need to learn to handle hard better. Let me say that again. Learn to handle hard better. I know you're waiting for your life to get better and to graduate. It's going to get better. You're going to get married. It's going to get better. You're going to find a job. It's going to get better. But life does not get easier. You have to handle hard better. Jesus Christ said in this world, you're going to have a lot of problems. But be of good cheer, he says, I have overcome the world. John says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And therefore, we should praise the Lord that even though we live in this very challenging and difficult world, as the book of Luke reminds us, the cares and the distresses and the troubles of this world have a way uh, to weighing us down. We need to keep our heads lifted because our redemption Is drawing nigh. And if you hear anything this morning, let us reflect on this wonderful week in which we are looking back 2,000 years at a a, a tremendous thing that took place where the immeasurable power of God was manifest in His Son, Jesus Christ, who suffered and bled and died on a cross. He was buried, but He was raised from the dead with the immeasurable power of God in Him that is also in work in our lives. Praise God. His holy name. What has gripped your heart regarding ministry? Are you trying to do it under your own strength? By the way, it doesn't matter what age you are. I'm 72 years old. I've got a lot of tricks uh, in my ministry bag. But nothing is sufficient enough for the moment, even this moment this morning for me, than for God's power that he would grant that according to his riches of glory to speak to you in this situation today with what you're going in. So the Apostle Paul begins to pray. He bows down on behalf of the church at Ephesus, which was obviously losing its first love according to the book of Revelation. And he prayed that God, through the riches of his grace would grant power and strength through the Holy Spirit to His people at this church and their inner being. That's what God is doing in all of our lives. Paul bowed his knee to pray. He challenged them, and we are challenged today to look to God and our help for time of need. We're to be anxious for nothing but to cast all of our cares on his feet because he cares for us. If you need wisdom, we're to ask of God who gives abundantly to all who ask him. If you're looking for strength, God strengthens us through his Holy Spirit for any environment, any issue, any ministry challenge that we'll ever face because his grace is sufficient for us. I think what Paul is saying in this article, we are to position ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ, not relying on anything on our own as we look to him. And by the way, sometimes to get our attention, God places us in situations where there's nothing we can do under our own strength to get out of that situation. Has that ever happened to you? 
About 23 years ago, I think it was, before the beginning of the war in Iraq, I was at the, in a camp in Kuwait, and we were preparing to go north into Baghdad, 665 miles. And right before we began our offensive, Saddam Hussein and his forces fired about 12 theater ballistic missiles all throughout our camps in Kuwait. Now, I don't know about you. I, I've never had a missile fired at me before, but it's a significant emotional event. It's one of those things you can't outrun because it explodes with shrapnel uh, to cover a, a large distance. But I remember running, briskly walking with our soldiers to our bunkers uh, to wait for the theater ballistic missiles to be shot out of the air by Patriot missiles. I remember sitting in that bunker with a, with a crowd of young men and women, all of, all of them young enough to be my children. Uh, waiting for about two minutes. I thought it was about two minutes. It seemed like a lifetime. But I can tell you, I sent up a bunch of prayers to the Lord in that two-minute prayer time. I, I prayed for every sin I'd committed or thought about committing, and, and, and I prayed my prayer list. And after I'd finished, I looked around at these young men and women and hoped that their prayer life was all right, but I covered them in prayer. By the way, I was told it only takes about 18 to 20 seconds for that missile to have struck us. So it wasn't even two minutes. But while I was there waiting, sometimes when we have lost our strength, there is no way out unless God brings us out. He reminds us of his power and strength. And in that bunker, he reminded me of a verse I'd never really quoted, but I had read it. But it became alive to me. And God posited it in my inner being so that days in which I don't know how it's going to end... I'm reminded of what I was reminded in that bunker by God's priceless word from the book of Zephaniah. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save you. He takes great delight in you. He quiets you with his love. He rejoices over you. With singing. When we fully grasp the importance of God's power available for us, being poured into us, strong and powerful like a mighty river, Jesus said in John chapter 7, If any of you are thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the strength that I'm talking about this morning. When that becomes your prayer, when you pray that over your church, over your fellow brother and sister in Christ, over your family, some marvelous things take place. As Paul is praying for God's power to come upon the church of Ephesus, the scripture says in verse 17 that Christ begins to dwell and the hearts through faith of those who trust in the Lord. When you realize that I want my zip code to be Jesus. When you say, I'm going to hide under the shelter and the shadow of his wings. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And I will run into it. I will stay there. My heart, my soul, my life, I'm committed. I am in regardless Paul says in the book of Colossians, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live for the glory of God and his life that is in me. I once heard the story of a pastor, very busy, things to do, places to go, people to see, rendezvous with destiny. He was always busy. His calendar, he had no white space. You know, hey, who needs the Sabbath? He was just always working, always ministering. One day during the close of a service, a little lady was waiting there to speak to him, and he kept being delayed by long conversations. She didn't move. Finally, before the church doors were closed, she was still there. She comes up to the pastor. He said, how can I pray for you? She said, well, I actually have a word from the Lord for you. I said, okay, well, we're not one of those churches, but what is your word? She said, well, God just told me to tell you, Pastor, I miss you. I miss you. 
To me, that's a reminder to all of us that we can be so busily engaged in ministry for the sake of the gospel and for Jesus Christ that we've gone off and left him. We have stepped out of the boat. And then we call him to help us when things start getting rough. The apostle Paul is telling the church at Ephesus, he's telling me, he's telling us, live in the constant relationship with Jesus Christ. Secondly, he goes on to say, and, and love, love God. Allow God's love to go deeper into your life that, that not only Christ is dwelling in you, but you're firmly rooted and grounded in him. Develop capacity as a disciple for Jesus Christ, constantly living in the word, constantly praying in faith, constantly walking with him, becoming aware of his indescribable gift and glory, becoming aware of his grace and mercy, becoming infatuated by this, having a magnificent obsession, as someone once said, for God's love and his goodness for you and for me. Pondering John 3.16, for God so loved the world. So a question for all of us this morning, has your love for Jesus going deeper? Jesus prophesied to his disciples that before the Son of Man returns, that the love of most men and women will have grown cold. I pray that that does not become a commentary on the church of Jesus Christ, but that we are so deeply in love with him. We're so rooted and grounded that the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. We cannot be moved or shaken or we will not compromise our faith, but we will, with a prophetic, thus saith the Lord, this is the word of God that requires deep love for Jesus. Thirdly, as Paul is praying for the power of God to come into the hearts of these people, he prays that they would, that, that they would comprehend with all of the saints what's the breadth and the length and height and depth of Jesus' love. Paul is basically saying... I pray that you will be longing for, that you will be laying hold of, that you will catch a glimpse, that you will comprehend with all of the saints. The love of Jesus Christ, that God would love us so much that he sent his son to die for us. William Cooper was an 18th century poet and hymn writer in England. His dad was a rector and eventually became a chaplain. At the age of six, William Cooper's mother died unexpectedly, and it, it shook him so much that he actually was never the same again. He was sent to a boarding, boarding school, and uh, his biography says that he saw more of the shoes of his fellow students than their faces because he was tremendously bullied at school, developed deep depression and anxiety, mental illness as an adult, tried to commit suicide four times. It, it, it's sort of sad, sort of humorous. He was into fountain pens like uh, Dr. Allen and I am as well. He tried to kill himself four times with his, with his gold-nibbed fountain pen. Never worked. Finally, after the fourth attempt, he went to God's Word and he read Zechariah 13, verse 1. On that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem to be cleansed from their sins and all uncleanness. And that so moved him. He confessed his sins and rededicated his life to Jesus Christ. And he wrote a very beautiful hymn that I'm sure you're familiar with. There's a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that stain. Lose all of their guilty stains. Sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. The Apostle Paul is on his, on his face, on his knees. He's praying for the church at Ephesus that they may live their lives 
24-7 under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That they may love him with such a depth that they are grounded and rooted. Their foundation is Jesus. That they would linger and try their best to comprehend God's great love for them. And finally, that they might know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus And the word is speaking to us today that we have really one lifelong mission besides the Great Commission. Our quest should be to know the love of God through Christ that surpasses knowledge. That we know Jesus intimately, personally, daily. In the book of Romans chapter 11 is... As the Apostle Paul is talking about how the gospel will eventually come to the people of God, the Jews, the, 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 the blinders will be removed. As he was reflecting on God's salvation plan for all of the world, here's what he says in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable. Are his ways. We should have a quest the rest of our life, and and obviously you had a taste of that, or you wouldn't be in this room today. And while you are here, I pray that you don't lose that desire and that quest to know that you know that you know the knowledge of God that's still beyond our measure. It's still beyond our reach, and yet that is what we're supposed to do. I don't know about you, but I've had those moments in my life. I think of a time 20 or 30 years ago, shortly after the Gander crash at Gander, Newfoundland. I was a chaplain at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and our soldiers were on that plane coming back from the multinational peacekeeping mission in the Sinai. And the the plane exploded on takeoff and 248 soldiers were killed. It still remains the largest mass casualty uh, of our troops in history. I can't tell you how it was to uh, do memorial ceremonies and services, to make death notifications to next of kin, to parents, to wives, husbands, children. But I'll tell you, we finished our last one in, in March So from December to March, the problem was there were some, the bodies were so badly uh, damaged that uh, we didn't have uh, some of the DNA scientific methodology that we have today. It took four months to identify everyone. It It was an open gash, an open wound in my ministry because we had not done that last service. So I was empty. I had nothing. And I remember praying to the Lord and actually living out some of the things I've mentioned this morning, that I renewed my love to the Lord. God, I can't do this without you. That I longed for him, that I lingered to comprehend his great love for me, pursuing him and to know him. And I remember a particular moment when he overwhelmed me with, as the Apostle Paul says, to be filled with all the fullness of God. All I can say at this particular point in this service is that at that particular moment in my life, as God filled me with all of the fullness of his love for me, I realized for the first time in my my life that God really was enough to cover my sins with the blood of Jesus. It was an overwhelming experience for me to know that I knew that I knew that when Jesus died on the cross for me, That's all I needed for any sin I'd committed or ever will commit. That's how powerful God's blood is. One of the scriptures that I use often in counseling our troops, many of them who suffer post-traumatic stress, mild traumatic brain injury or suicidal ideation, in many cases as they try to uh, relieve the pain through alcohol, drugs, pornography, other things, and they feel so dirty, 
as we go through a time of them finding Jesus as Savior or renewing their lives as, as Christians and asking forgiveness of their sins, I often take them to Romans 8, 1, which overwhelms me with God's love. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a powerful word from God's heart, the riches of his glory over all of us. Well, let me conclude. Life is hard. We need to learn to handle hard better. I pray for you and we pray for one another that God in the riches of his glory will strengthen us with power through his Holy Spirit in our inner being to live with Jesus 24-7, to love him, to linger and reflect on what he has done for us and to make it our lifelong quest and mission to pursue the love, the fullness, and the knowledge of God all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.